The following program is shot in 4K high dynamic range and broadcast in high definition from Capital Broadcasting Company. Mother and father did not get the opportunity to go to high school. They grew up in rural South Carolina. They had to pick cucumber and cotton. You know, dirt roads, outhouses, and life was tough. Life was tough uh, for them. And they were living in generational poverty. Michelle Gathers Clark says her parents moved to New York City to take civil service jobs. They lived in public housing. I recognized that in public housing there were all kinds of people and, you know, sometimes crime was happening. We didn't have much, but what we had was clean and it was ours. I recognized that my parents couldn't help me with my homework by the time I was in fourth grade. But her mother's words inspired her. And she said to me, you take care of your brother and sister and go to college. Go to college. When Clark was in the eighth grade, her mother died. After that, she and her siblings went to live with their aunt and uncle. For a while, I thought my dream of going to college could never happen. Her aunt and uncle encouraged her to focus on school. I had some extraordinary teachers who actually saw something in me I didn't see in myself. A teacher nominated Clark for the federal stay in school program, which led to a government clerical job at 15. She got into the junior achievement program, where a mentor sent her to a Dale Carnegie course. So there are a lot of things going on that together needed a resume and a profile together of someone who could be the first person in their family to go to college. Clark went to Long Island University, earned an accounting degree, and became a CPA. American Express hired her as an internal auditor. Got promoted through the ranks, then went to risk management. From risk management said, I want to run one of our servicing centers because I aspire to be a senior vice president here. And she became one. She made a mid-six-figure salary, putting her in the top 1% of earners in North Carolina, the place she made home. What type of lifestyle did it provide for you? I could buy a home in the neighborhood I wanted to buy a home in. My reality was I could vacation where I wanted to vacation. My reality was I could put money in the bank. You could buy things. I could buy what I wanted, when I wanted. That's not Tasha Hampton's reality. When you get your paycheck, it's like it's gone before you even, before you even get the money in your hand, just adding up the bills that you have and stuff like that, it's like it's gone. Like Clark, Hampton grew up in a working class family, hers in upstate New York. I'm one of six kids, so you know, we had our struggles and we didn't always get the things that we wanted, but we were blessed with the things that we needed. After high school graduation, Hampton waited a few years before enrolling in college. Once I started, you know, things just didn't go the way that I had planned. Study was not a priority. It really wasn't. It really wasn't. Got caught up with the wrong people and went the wrong way. You know, so that's how I ended up.
expecting my babies, you know, at 24. So I end up dropping out of college, you know, just to take care of them. Hampton is now taking care of three daughters. She works as a housekeeper in a retirement community, making less than $11 an hour. It's a struggle, you know, not be, being able to provide them, you know, the things that they feel that they should have. How tough is that? Some days, my strength just so weak. All I can do is just call on um, God's name, you know. All I can do is just, just pray. Hampton lives in public housing. Food stamps help with the groceries. Medicaid helps with health care. Even with the assistance, I still sometimes fall short. <laughs> Hampton thinks she should get paid more for the work she's doing. I understand, you know, everyone have a business and, you know, you have to stay in your lane. I get that. But at the same time, let's be fair. I want to be able to work and actually get paid for the work that I'm doing. The lives of Tasha Hampton and Michelle Gathers Clark help illustrate the income gap that exists here in North Carolina and across the country and some of the barriers that make it hard for so many people to pull themselves out of poverty. Almost all of the wealth and much of the income is going to the top 1%. During last year's presidential campaign, we heard a lot about the 1% and the 99%. In North Carolina, the average income of the top 1% of earners is almost $746,000, while the average income of the bottom 99%, just over $42,000. It's a ratio of 18 to 1. Nationally, average CEO pay is 335 times the amount of the average worker. I would hate to say greed, um, but when it comes down to that, that's 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 what it is, greed. This guy was born in 1957. He's Economics professor James model. Johnson you know of UNC's Keenan Flagler Business School <laughs> blames much of the problem on the public sector's inability to keep up with the private sector's globalization and automation. You know, the world economy today is just so dramatically different from 30 years ago. It raises the question, well, what do you need in your toolkit in order to thrive and prosper in an economy where the new normal is certain uncertainty? Traditional working class jobs and things like furniture and textile manufacturing began disappearing in the 1980s. Those jobs began to, to move offshore, uh, leaving behind a population that did not have the skills to compete in an emerging information-based economy. In the 1990s, white-collar jobs began to move offshore, too. Things like customer call centers and routine business functions. And in the 2000s, jobs in research and development began to follow. If you look at what major corporations began to do, they began to tap into enormous talent around the world in India and China and other places uh, to begin to do innovation. And innovation has led to automation, with robots replacing jobs that humans used to do by hand. They say the robot is never late for work. They don't talk back. They work three shifts. They don't have to pay them workman's compensation. Johnson says wealth is increasingly concentrated in the hands of innovators and entrepreneurs and their investors, leaving too many others behind. He says it's contributed to concentrated poverty and the epidemic of opioid addiction. We cannot thrive and prosper leaving this much human capital undeveloped in American society. Later, finding solutions. And we've got to say, how do we solve this as a capitalistic society? But next, the wealth inequalities between our communities. We have one grocery store uh, in 700 square miles. If you want to see wealth inequality between communities in our state, just take a drive through Wake and Bertie counties. You can clearly see the differences from their government headquarters to their industries, their schools, their churches, and their homes. 
you can see it in the statistics too. The median annual household income of just over $64,000 in Wake is more than double what it is in Bertie. The poverty rate of more than 24% in Bertie is almost quadruple the rate in Wake. Wake is the second fastest growing county of over a million people in the country. What we have here is an urban area that can provide uh, more opportunities for anybody looking for employment or anybody looking for the quality of life that, that we're able to have. That includes recreation, <laughs> entertainment like sporting events and concerts, and seemingly endless choices in shopping and dining. Good public schools and three major research universities in the area help too. That just produce this pipeline of employees that are very, very valuable and attractive to employers. About 48% of Wake County adults have a bachelor's degree or higher compared to only 11% in Bertie County. Uh, this is our Lancaster 5, our newest model. Precision Hawk CEO Michael Chazen says all of those attributes are why his company moved from Indiana to Raleigh. The company makes this fixed wing drone and modifies it and other drones with software that helps industry and agriculture. For example, a farmer might fly a Precision Hawk drone to gather data about his fields how many plants that you uh, have growing below, where there might be an infestation, uh, figuring out what parts of your farm might need more water. Chazen says Research Triangle Park and the area's research universities have created fertile ground for entrepreneurs. He says it's turning the area into a technology hub perfectly suited to his company. Just this year alone, uh, we're probably seeing uh, north of 300 uh, percent growth in our sales pipeline. We're going to be hiring a number of positions this year uh, in uh, software development and consulting and sales and um, other uh, areas across the company to help us support this tremendous amount of growth that we're, we're seeing. Good. Looking good. Bertie County native Toshika Watson says there's no such growth in her community. Poor is no jobs. At least no good ones. Watson says she found herself in dead-end jobs that required hard work for low pay. As life went on, I was like, I don't, I want better for myself. That's why she enrolled in the cosmetology program at nearby Martin Community College. She plans to work in a salon in Greenville, then eventually open her own, but not in Bertie County. I'm thinking about moving to Charlotte either Charlotte, Fayetteville, or Raleigh. Much of Bertie's industry has been moving elsewhere, too, over the past couple of decades. Golden Peanut, a shelling facility that employed about 100 people. Gregory Manufacturing, a maker of agricultural equipment that employed thousands at its peak. Wrangler Jeans had nearly 400 workers, and Lee Lumber Company employed 350. The job losses have decimated small Bertie County towns like Allander. They've lost their bank, uh, they've lost their pharmacy, uh, and that's mostly due to the manufacturing uh, that was moved out of the country uh, as a result of the North American Free Trade Agreement. It's all left Bertie County with a property tax base of only about $1.2 billion compared to Wake County's more than $127 billion. And it really forces you to prioritize and in many ways look for better ways of doing business. Bertie does have a Purdue poultry processing plant. It employs 2,000 people and helps support the local farmers. But the county manager says it's operating under capacity. So is Bertie Correctional Institution, which houses 1,500 inmates and employs nearly 500 people. Today, we could hire 250 people, 150 up at, at the Purdue facility, and probably 100 at the prison facility if folks had the qualifications, had the work ethic, work ethic and could pass the, the drug test. Okay, he can have more as long as you're in control. Schools are part of the answer. But Sauer says too many children are unprepared for kindergarten. 
knowing their alphabet, knowing their uh, being able to count, even knowing their parents' name. We don't control the raw material that comes to our door. As an employer, you can always say, I'm going to reject this because it doesn't meet our standards. Anybody that comes to our door, we're going to work with. Succeeding at that requires quality teachers, but attracting and keeping them is a challenge. While Wake County is able to lure teachers by offering a supplement of over $6,300 a year on top of their state salary, Bertie offers no supplement at all. I think we could recruit more qualified, high quality teachers if there was some way that we could level the playing field as far as supplements. What's another way you can make seven cents? Low teacher pay contributes to high teacher turnover. In one year they recruited 17 new teachers. Um, after a year we had three of them still living in the county. So do you agree with the answers? Bertie's lack of amenities makes it tough to keep them. We don't have shopping malls. We don't have a Walmart in this community. Um, we, we have one grocery store uh, in 700 square miles. Wake has hundreds of grocery stores, shopping centers, and restaurants. That's just a natural draw, and, that, and that, that brings folks in. Creating growth that the Wake school system struggles with. It does get frustrating to try and accommodate between two and 3,000 new students per year, and that's lower than it was in the last few years. Oh, yeah, that's good. But Merrill says he had rather deal with growing pains than shrinking revenue and student populations. There were nearly 4,000 students in Bertie County Schools in 1998. Now there's only 2,200. An economist report to a legislative committee last year illustrates the urban-rural divide in our state. It shows only five of the state's 100 counties have average annual pay above the state average. All of them, like Wake, are urban. The urban and, and rural disparities are, are a real issue and, and, and impact lives uh, and, and future generations. By virtue of where a child is born, uh, he or she is going to have a world of different opportunities. So what are the answers to easing the wealth disparities between people and communities? Somebody has to make the point that this is a competitiveness issue. This WREO documentary is available on demand on all these platforms. For exclusive bonus video from tonight's program, go to WRALdocumentary.com and talk to us by following WRAL Doc on Facebook and Twitter. To improve its economy and create jobs, Bertie County is looking at taking advantage of assets it has that Wake County doesn't. It sees the Albemarle Sound and its rivers, wetlands, and woodlands as avenues for building ecotourism and retirement communities. We've got a, a governing body right now in the county that is very eager to improve the quality of life. Meanwhile, the county's economic backbone is agriculture, but that doesn't provide many full-time jobs, and even agriculture is becoming more dependent on technology. Advanced technology has advanced the skills people need to compete in today's global economy. It's basically a borderless economy in terms of where you access talent. Uh, we've suffered tremendously because there have been uh, uh, only an increasingly few people who have the skill set to be able to compete in that economy and a large population left behind with skills mismatches that don't allow them to compete. Johnson says those skills are the ability to see new opportunities, take advantage of them, adapt to change, and work with people from other cultures. Our education system is not aligned to provide our people with those skills. Tasha Hampton would like to go back to school to improve her skills. I need a better job, a better financial situation trying to get my girls out of the situation that we're in into a better environment um, around more positive people. But she doesn't see a way to go back to school and still take care of her children. Working, coming home, fixing dinner, helping the kids with the homework, doing the household chores, 
it's like I'd be so beat at the end of the night, you know, to even, you know, think about schoolwork. It's one of the barriers many low-income people face trying to improve their situation. So is a paycheck that covers only the basic necessities. They can never make it. They can never make it to the upper ranks of income because they can never save a dime. They don't have any investable income. Clark says the welfare cliff is another barrier where making just a little extra money can cost a person all of their benefits. We need a structure of economic reform that allows everyone to fully participate in our economic systems. Uh, and today that does not happen. Uh, and people are left out. The government could help by fixing the welfare cliff, lowering tuition costs at public colleges and universities, and subsidizing child care for single working parents like Hampton. I would love that. But Clark says the government alone can't solve the income inequality problem. We have to ask the corporate structure to participate. A corporate structure Clark decided to leave. She wanted to spend more time with her husband and daughter in Greensboro. I was concerned with superstar status in corporate America. And I was not the best mother, and I was not a great wife. What else do you have to do today, Steve? Clark took a far less lucrative job close to home as CEO of the United Way of Greensboro. She says it's given her an opportunity to help people in need. And maybe that's a clue to the broader solution of income inequality. I know that the path is not easy. I know that people need help. Just like she once needed help. And many people have shed light in my life, and I'm grateful. Clark understands people can't pick themselves up by their own bootstraps if they can't afford to buy their own boots.